Thank you very much, Judith and Hans Ole, for this uh, very kind invitation to be here. Uh, distinguished members of the European Parliament, uh, Baroness Hogg, Sir John. Um, I was asked to give a sort of scene setter here, a very short one, and um, I was even told to be a bit provocative, so <laughs> here goes. Well, <laughs> we've heard a lot this morning about uh, the progress we've made. Um, let's uh, please recall that we're now at the end of the sixth year of this crisis. I, I always thought it started at um, summer 2007. And I think it's appropriate that we do ask, after six years, uh, where are we? Uh, do actually, and we need an honest answer here, uh, do we have today a safer, sounder, more sustainable, global and European system? I don't think we should just think in terms of one jurisdiction or another. The global financial system is interconnected, as we're fully aware. Uh, can we uh, honestly say that capital today is being uh, allocated uh, more efficiently? Uh, I read uh, quite a lot of problems in the SME sector, for example. Uh, are consumer markets working better? Is there less uh, mis-selling? Uh, are we sure that markets are actually not fragmenting, either in Europe uh, or globally? Uh, and if we can't answer those questions uh, with a strong yes, can we at least say that we're on the right road, uh, that we will get there, and if we think we're going to get there, when are these key parameters of safety, soundness, and sustainability uh, going to be uh, among us? Uh, there's no shortage of activity, uh, either in Europe or globally. Um, Commissioner Barnier, uh, if you look at his uh, sheet of paper with all the initiatives, more than 30 or 40 of them, uh, the SEC uh, tells me, uh, SEC is one of my members in IOSCO, that it uh, participates in no less than 85 international work streams. Um, actually, at the global level, there's no less than 18 international organizations with some fingers uh, in the pie. So, um, is the job being done, and what are the priorities? What's the tests that we should be looking at? Um, uh, and are the rules... Uh, uh, it's all right drawing up rules, but uh, are they being implemented in broadly equivalent ways, either in Europe or at the global level? Well, what are the priorities that I like to think of? The first, and has always been my priority, is the resolution of fail or failing financial institutions. I think it's very good news yesterday that uh, the European Council seems to have moved forward. It'd be interesting to hear from Sharon uh, uh, how the Parliament's going to take this, uh, uh, this forward. Um, but uh, is all of this going to work on a cross-border basis um, uh, with our American uh, colleagues uh, around the world? Uh, are we sure there won't be ring fencing? Are we sure that a resolution authority, the single point of entry, is going to be able to do the job uh, on its own? And I think uh, the second question, and I say this for Sir John's benefit, but I think the structural change uh, that he and others have asked for, Likan and Volker, where is that? Um, is that necessary if the resolution framework works? Second set of big priorities for me, obviously, is the, is the bank capital requirements. Uh, we all know that uh, bank capital has been ramped up. But at the same time, uh, we have seen that the risk weights, both for the trading book and the banking book, seem to be rather random. Does that mean we've got global standards, European standards? Or does it mean we've got uh, a variance of uh, an unacceptable degree? What about the shadow banking system, my priority number three? We just heard that mentioned. Do we really understand it? Uh, we're regulating this in in compartments, money market funds and securitization, repos, securities lending, etc., etc. How do all these pieces fit together? Do we understand the collateral effects of one part of uh, one change, set of changes uh, on another? Uh, I think the shadow banking system uh, is of uh, great concern. We sort of discovered in this crisis that uh, it's 40% or so of global banking assets. 
uh, but I'm not sure we understand it very well. And um, I have to say that I don't think we've got even got a full set of data from which to monitor it. Derivatives, well, uh, I think there's been a lot of intellectual progress on the main strands of that, OTC derivatives. But as everybody's aware in this room, there are unresolved uh, differences between the United States and foreign regulators. Uh, there are issues about uh, margin requirements. Trade repositories, I thought they were meant to be simple systems whereby you collected the data and everybody had access to it. Sort of seems to have gone got much more, uh, uh, much more complicated. In fact, the FSB has decided to set up a group on aggregation, which will report in um, May 2014. Um, on the uh, financial market infrastructures, um, very important work. We've been very involved in that in IOSCO, uh, and uh, we hope uh, that uh, they, uh, uh, the safety systems in those institutions will be sound. Final point, corporate culture. Has that really changed uh, in financial markets? Uh, I was sort of getting a little bit optimistic until the LIBOR and si uh, su uh, subsequent scandals came along. Uh, and IOSCO has been very much at the forefront of drawing up a set of global standards, which I believe will be uh, the global standards uh, for this. So has corporate culture changed? Do we have Arlene's done some heroic work on this in the European Parliament. Do we have sufficiently strong standards to dissuade the worst forms of behavior? Uh, John, those are a few thoughts I have. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, David. I, you know, uh, we're hoping that you, you stay with us and, and actually will maybe give us a bit of resolution, that being one of your priorities. Um, Well, we have a big role to play, John. I mean, I could go on, but uh, we're very involved in, for example, all the work on uh, financial market infrastructures. We're very involved in trade repository work through CPSS, IOSCO. We're very involved. In fact, we've worked extremely hard uh, over the last uh, 10 days or so to draw up with our colleagues in the Basel Committee uh, the basic uh, uh, framework rules uh, for initial margin requirements for non clear derivatives. So uh, we're very involved in, in many aspects of that. Uh, what I'm pointing to is still a number of unfinished pieces in the context of, uh, of the priorities that I've I I identified. Yeah, I'm just saying I think there's a long way to go in all of these subjects. Hmm? Oh, oh. Well, um, I mean, as you know, we, uh, I think it's 40 financial services uh, pieces of uh, legislation that we have dealt with so far, and uh, Michelle seems to have got about uh, 11 more that potentially could come forward, and we will be dealing with all of those right up until the end of the mandate, which is basically the middle of April. Uh, it, it's quite likely, of course, that the council won't keep up with everything that we've done. So where we've got to will be available for the new parliament to pick up if it so wishes. Uh, obviously, key things like uh, recovery and resolution uh, will be done. And I think that uh, I can see the, the, the position that has come from the council from what little I know of it because nobody's sent me a report yet uh, it looks as if we're not a million miles away on some of the key issues but experience tells me that when you get into a trialogue there'll be a lot of little issues that people didn't think were key that suddenly become key um, uh, the Parliament has got some things in it that I don't myself understand. I still can't get my head around how you bail in a derivative and what you get, for example. 
um, uh, which is actually in the Parliament text. Uh, so uh, I, I, wait, I wait to see what, what, where we go with that. But I mean, looking at, at the uh, achievements that we've had, and, and they're not just the achievements of the Parliament, it's of Europe in, in this mandate so far. Uh, we've got the European supervisory authorities and, and a whole new way of doing things, a whole new concept of a, of a single rule book of regulations, a lot more uh, level two regulatory technical standards. The, the problem, which I think Stephen Mayor uh, fingered in his speech on this, is that uh, we, we don't have the powers of intervention at the European level by the European supervisory authorities, and we're very limited in what we can craft in that area because of the uh, existing case law, the so-called Moroni case. Um, I've long said that I stood ready to take the Moroni case back to the ECJ and ask for reinterpretation. Uh, and I have a standing deal with the uh, chair of the um, Legal Affairs Committee that we can press the go button on that, if you like, when, when we want. But we've also both us thought that it was a good idea to wait and see uh, how the ESAs developed so we had something to look at. Uh, before we did that or that the ECJ would have something to look at for a reinterpretation of that in the light of um, actually what the circumstances are in financial markets. So I think that's probably you know, best left for a little way in the future, though it might happen um, through, through another route. Um, obviously, EMEA was big because that was the big G20 idea about regulating OTCs, and by and large, I think we've done a, a good job there. I think we've got a lot of teething troubles in that and on a lot of other legislation with our third country um, uh, issues um, and, and trying to get equivalence or equivalence by another name. We actually said in EMEA that what we did there was not to be a template and the uh, Commission made a declaration to that effect and then proceeded to roll it out as a template on everything else. Um, so, and and I, do, I don't think that it necessarily works. Uh, we were due to have reviews of MIFID and market abuse and, and, and we've done those uh, and of course we've updated the things that perhaps were already in, in mind for the reviews uh, as, as things have come along. I and mean, I don't want to steal any of Arlene's thunder on market abuse, but I mean, even in the last trialogue, we were uh, you know, going through to check that the, the spot FX rigging that we've heard allegations about would have been covered. Um, and, and, and so we, we still do face, to some extent, a moving field on these things. CRD4 is huge. We know all the arguments about um, uh, trying to get growth at the same time that you're, you're clamping down on the amount of capital. Uh, and of course, everybody knows about the Parliament's bonus uh, cap. But we, we actually did quite a lot of other things. We, we tried to promote growth by relaxing the conditions for trade finance and SMEs. Um, we also inserted quite a few things like basic crisis resolution for all banks, not just the top ones, uh, and getting to grip with EMEA interactions. And we've increased reporting requirements, particularly in order to get information so that we can begin to tackle uh, some of these shadow banking issues. We don't really think that you can tackle issues you don't know anything about. So it's a jolly good idea to collect in the information. And so, uh, you know, and we've in included things like asset encumbrance and securities lending. Because um, again, it's all the more important, for, especially for investors, and we hope that ultimately we can get this out into the public domain, not just to regulators. But if you're in danger of being bailed in, which is more the case now than it used to be, then perhaps you need to know what the full cushions are before you get hit. And so the securities lending and asset encumbrance is, is, quite, is, is, is very important there. So, and, and we've endeavoured to try and, and put the seeds of getting this information in place in CRD4. I've, I've dealt with resolution and recovery and you know, contrary to what the Minister said, there isn't a European deal until they've actually agreed it with us. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and so, uh, which I'm pleased to say, Bloomberg actually did put in, into their report on it. Um, so well done, Bloomberg. Um, uh, but, but, but I mean, it, 
again, in that, we, we, we adjusted as we were going through the Parliament's position when the Cyprus debacle came along. Uh, there had been some uh, you know, pushback about whether or not we should have depositor preference and thinking sort of changed overnight and also thinking about, well, how much flexibility can you have when, when we saw yo-yoing going on uh, in, in that. So, so you know, we're living in, in, in sort of real-time amendment and updating of some of the things that we're doing, which again raises the question of, well, how do we do something when we need to do it very quickly? I mean, we can just about get legislation, quick fixes done in, in six weeks if we, if we really have to. That seems to be the minimum. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and alongside all of these things, and there are many more that, that have been mentioned by some other speakers earlier this morning, um, we, we've, we've had the whole euro crisis and the single uh, supervisory mechanism and, and the impact that that will make uh, and the impact of that in particular on the um, European Banking Authority. And then we have calls for saying, well, shouldn't we have a, a, a single European uh, market and I call yes it's called the single market uh, there isn't a logic to have a eurozone market uh, in the same way that there is a logic to have certain things to do with the, the, the euro and monetary stability going together so I think it's very important that, that we don't make some mistake of saying we want a market within a market because the, the markets need to be open and frankly you know, you can't go anywhere without looking at the dollar, and that doesn't seem to me to be anything that's regulated or uh, looked after by, by the EU as such. But all of these things, I mean, we can't have stable markets if we don't have stable banks. Um, they, they are intertwined, so it, it, it's, a, it's a whole big picture. But there is, a, there is still a lot more to do. There's the shadow banking um, and, and I think the, the aggregation of data issues that, that David has talked about. I mean, I, I mean, it's ridiculous that now we're going to be in a worse position with trade repositories than before we started on that. That certainly wasn't what the G20 wanted. Um, and and I, I think we just have to be, be prepared to force this. And if people are hiding behind intellectual property rights and other things, forget it. I, 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 it, it, it it's... It's all a puff, and I say that as a patent attorney, so I slightly know what I'm talking about in that area. Um, and, but, uh, but it seems to me that gathering information is the fundamental, and, and if we really, in this age of technology, cannot get to the position that we get real-time transaction mapping in, this, in, in the foreseeable future. So I'm a stage beyond you. I'm not just aggregates. We want real-time financial transaction mapping. You know, Think what you can do with the internet. The technology exists. You can have things in headers. You can strip bits out. You can deal with privacy. The technology exists. Um, and, and, and therefore, we should just say, right, we're going to go for it and really get a handle on this and get a handle on it globally. And that will help us also with the fact that markets are different in different places. Um, I think that's always a very dangerous thing, uh, uh, be, be, because um, yeah, the devil is in the detail of these things. I think uh, the fact that there is the emergency possibility that, that a member state can intervene, you know, if, if other, otherwise it's going to be a disaster, those are the kinds of things that we did foresee as well. We did want... The, the fact that there should be bail-in before you went to the, to the state. We recognised that you could have some you know, flexibility around the edges of things. We didn't go into any percentages of what had to be bailed in before you could go to where, so that, that will be interesting to, de to debate. I, I think in broad brush terms, though, and, and this applies, I think, across whatever we do in, in, in financial markets and banking, if you introduce uh, member state flexibility then you have to, have to look at the ESA uh, oversight and monitoring to make sure that it still fits within the single market. And, and I think that, that it may well end up 
being uh, a bit of a tension there because the member states by and large tend to try and uh, uh, shy away from too much uh, uh, binding technical standards and oversight by the ESAs and generally speaking the Parliament says well hey we're in a single market and we think if you want a bit of flexibility we want to know that there isn't any cheating around the edges mm -hmm. and that's what the ESAs are for. Thank you. Um, it's probably worth saying that the Financial Reporting Council in the UK <coughs> is responsible for regulation, standard setting and code development, not at all the same thing, in the, on those aspects of capital markets which relate to financial reporting, as, like it says on the tin, um, accounting and actuarial standards, auditing, corporate governance, and investor stewardship. It sounds like quite a long list. So having been given permission today to be a bit contrarian, I'd like to say now that I'm not going to talk as a regulator asking for more regulation. In fact, I'm going to give a bit of a warning um, because I think we have to be very careful about the initial question is regulation making European markets safer. Now, of course, what we need to do is make markets more transparent and to help those who put money, particularly those who put money at risk in these markets, comfortable about their integrity. That, but if we let it slide, as some people do, into much less likely to lose money then we're at danger of going down a slippery slope to the abandonment of risk capital. And if we look at what's happening in equity markets and has been happening over a longish period, and our host today has some fascinating data on that, particularly on the numbers of companies listing on listed markets, I think it should give us cause for concern. And we should be very careful not to write off the role of equity markets because it's equity markets that act as that wonderful connection, enabling savers to share in the growth of fast-growing companies rather than get some flat and flaccid return from a piece of debt. And it enables those growth, those growth companies to raise money um, from investors who are prepared to share the risk. And it seems to me if there was any more obvious example of uh, the folly of abandoning um, a, a commitment to markets for risk capital, it is what's happened overnight. Um, Sharon understands so much more of the detail that I, I, I won't even attempt to go into it. But what it does seem to demonstrate to me is a, a, a need to invent yet another form of risk capital because what is bail-in debt but debt that becomes risk capital? Now, why do I say this piece so noisily? You know, I should be a regulator who shouldn't act as a promoter of equity markets. Well, I do it because I worry that governments as a whole are focused on debt markets. And you can understand why. You know, governments don't issue equity. They raise debt, and God knows they're raising a lot of it at the moment. So it's understandable that they should be focused on those. But I do think it's important that we continue to recognize the role that equity markets can and must play. Now, Stephen Mayer earlier, I thought, excellently reminded us of the role that um, uh, equity plays in the development of growth companies in, in the US, both private equity and listed equity. And I spent some time in my life chairing a major private equity, actually listed private equity business. And I know that the relationship between private equity and listed equity is actually a very close one. They need, it's symbiotic, they need each other. Stephen quite rightly said that um, retail investors in particular 
need protection, otherwise they won't put their money at risk. But I would also say that we need to be very careful, ask the regulators, that in endeavouring to protect those investors, we don't um, take away their rights of ownership and vest those in regulators instead. And one of our clear principles at the FRC is that what we try to do is enhance accountability to the providers of capital, not wrest the role of policing the markets from the owners of capital and take them entirely unto ourselves. That's not because I believe equity markets are in any way perfect. They've demonstrated, God knows, lots of imperfections over the last um, seven, eight, nine, however long you want to define the crisis, period. But if we don't recognize their role and intent to help them to do better, simply take away their, the rights of owners of capital, invest them in regulators, then that capital will go elsewhere, outside Europe, outside OECD, to our loss in terms of growth, jobs, and wealth in the future. Sure. No, I, I, I wouldn't single that out. I, I'd be careful. Um, I think wh where I think the greatest danger is that in looking at regulatory change um, and indeed in looking at other aspects of the regulation, these markets which are in the hands of governments in the form of taxation rather than regulators, is that we look at these things in silos, that we attempt to solve one problem without looking at its knock-on effects elsewhere. And I think there are a number of examples where, for very good reasons, the focus has been too narrow and not looking at the knock-on consequences. And it's the accumulation of unintended consequences that can have a damaging effect on these markets. Thank you, John, and thank you very much for the invitation uh, to be part of this, uh, this conference. I'll, I'll focus my remarks on, on banking reform, but I think some of the points go, go wider, including to the shadow banking points that were made earlier. And while, as, as Sharon indicated, there are these dozens of initiatives, I'm going to boil it down to three headings. One is capital, one is resolution, and all the, all the things that were going on last night, the loss-bearing hierarchy and thirdly on structure. And in short, my view about where we are five years on under those headings is on the capital side with Basel III, very important progress, but it's heading to, I think, a very unambitious place. Resolution and bail-in, I think we have something that looks as though it's going to work quite well on paper, but whether in the heat of a crisis it would actually work, I think is a wide open question. And that links to the third point on structure, where although there have been debates in, uh, in, in some places like the UK, we're only really starting a proper international debate on those issues. So capital. Now, Basel III is clearly a lot better than what went before. We had uh, Stefan Kampeter talk about unregulated capitalism uh, in the run-up to the crisis. Well, it was certainly poorly regulated, but when you have major financial institutions operating on 50 times leverage, it, it's not clear to me that the word capitalism is, is so um, applicable. And we could have a great debate about risk-weighted assets, but just to do it in the metric of leverage, it, in a way it's pretty amazing that where we're trying to get to is a leverage backstop that's still 33 times. Mm -hmm. And then I've, I've been speaking to audiences where dozy members have said, 33 times, no wonder there was a crisis. And I say, no, 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 this is where we're hoping um, <laughs> to, 
to, to get to. And this is even for the, for the global SIFIs and, and all the rest. And that's why I think it's a very um, unambitious place. In common sense terms, historically, if you look at the economic history, you, you know, the US growth 100, 100 and more years ago, the banking system had leverage of four or five in that period, not 10, 20, still less um, 30 or 40. So I think we've still got a major issue there, and you're not really going to crack things like the doom loop problem of the bank balance sheets and the sovereign balance sheet interdependencies unless we've got a lot more loss absorbency in the system and capital, uh, equity capital is by far the best and most guaranteed loss absorber. Now, on to, on to resolution. The ICB, which I chaired, is best known for what it said on the structural reform front. We attached at least as much importance to questions about loss absorbency, not just equity capital, but trying to articulate a hierarchy of loss absorption, a hierarchy that was completely absent in practice in 08-09. When again, in textbook terms, oh yes, the bondholders would take the hit and you'd work your way down. Instead, the taxpayers were marched very near the front of the queue of loss absorbency and all sorts of bondholders came out whole, which is not how it was uh, supposed to work. Now, again, we've got, um, you know, some progress has been made, uh, including last night. I haven't um, fully digested um, what was agreed. But in terms of um, institutions for resolution to have means other than insolvency for orderly um, workouts to be arranged, to flip debt in instruments into equity and try and put the taxpayer uh, very remote from loss bearing and to try and put the insured depositor, and because of the state insurance schemes, it's all tied up with the taxpayer, again, very remote from bankruptcy. Again, these philosophically, this, is all, this all seems good and right to me. But I really do question whether in resolution we have got to the point where it is credible, either geographically with all the cross-border issues or functionally as between different kinds of banking. The UK government, and you could tell the same story for others, UK when it had to rescue RBS, even though banks have squillions of subsidiaries, you had on the, in the same entity a massive array, enormous array of interscrambled um, high street banking, domestic, other side of the world, derivatives, market making, all on the same book. So there was no choice but to rescue the whole lot or not to rescue it at all. You did not have any means of having a more um, discriminating approach, which, uh, and the, it's just a crazy use of taxpayer resources, but there was no alternative then. Are we, are we getting to a credible place where those alternatives really do um, exist now? Another thing that's been strangely missing from the debate is, okay, we know where Basel III is on equity capital. How much bailinable debt are institutions going to be required to have? There's this 8% figure um, that came out of the um, last night's development. That's not quite the same, th as I understand it, not quite the same thing as the minimum amount of um, equity plus bailinable debt. It's all to do with you can only get access to the, uh, you know, it's conditionality, you can only get access to the common fund if you've eaten through that amount. But it is extraordinary this number of years on that there hasn't been an international discussion of a quantified kind about what minimum levels of bail-inable debt, unsecured, more than a year to run, let's say, subject to a regulatory bail-in power. It's been a, a verbal, unquantified debate until um, very, very recently. And that's shocking given the scale of the problems that we're facing. Now, finally, on structure, we've had the, the UK Commission and the UK proposals are now going before Parliament, seem to come to the Lords. So I, I look to my right for, um, I, I hope, support on all that. We had Lickinen. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of Lickinen. I think in, in, it, it's very, very similar in many ways to the UK approach, which in a sense is surprising because the UK has a non-typical banking system. Um, for the EU, and Lickinen, unlike us, Lickinen was looking for Europe as a whole. But this idea that the common theme is structured universal banking. It's not anti-universal banking. It's structured universal banking, which is to say you have retail slash commercial banking in one entity within a wider group, and you have trading market making. You don't try and do this angels on the head of a pin. What's mm -hmm. speculative trading? Mm -hmm. You have the trading and market making, um, 
in a, in a, a separate entity. It's quite consistent with the real economy getting all the benefits of universal banking. It's consistent with the diversification benefits of universal banking, but it is a much safer structure. Just as if you're in a boat, big boat, you want um, bulkheads in the hull, you want structure there. Okay, you've got to have some extra metal, bit of cost to create it, but there are many circumstances where you would be very glad of that. And it's for reasons of insulation. Again, others, Stefan Kampeter among them, were talking about the contagion points. It's not a perfect barrier, just as it isn't in the hull of a ship, but it's um, a, a something you could be very glad to have. And it's also a form of insulation outward. It is astonishing how retail deposits in Europe were funding not just bubbles in, in Spain and Ireland and elsewhere. They were doing a huge amount of funding of US subprime. You had European global banks at all sorts of points in the shadow banking chain between US savers in dollars and US borrowers, including in the, in the mortgage market. And without some structural reform, you know, it's fine for banks to do that. I just don't think European deposits uh, and the state behind them should be doing that. Structural reform, to my mind, is essential for the credibility of resolution. So my response to David, who said, if you've got resolvability anyway, why bother about structure? My answer is, well, you're not going to have resolvability anyway unless you do something structural. Uh, with the major banks, and this is all part of getting the, um, the taxpayer more decisively off the hook. So I very much hope that the, all the European processes and the Parliament and, and uh, um, Arlene's committee is very, very important in all this. I hope that Commissioner Barnier, when there is the response following the consultation on Lickenen and the Parliament and the, uh, the institutions of the Council, will adopt Lickenen or something very like it. We would then have structured universal banking, which would give a further gain globally, the opposite of fragmentation. The US has structured universal banking. Under Glass-Steagall, they didn't have universal banking. When that was repealed, <coughs> you could have affiliates within the same group, but they are still separate affiliates. And Dodd-Frank has been doing things to um, make firmer, the se make stronger the separations between the different affiliates, which got very lax in, in the run-up to crisis. So here I think there's a big opportunity for Europe and it would be convergence globally on structured universal banking, not divergence. Thanks for that, uh, John. Uh, you mentioned this uh, meeting in uh, Central Table for the Army of Rugby Summit for um, on Saturday this uh, is about separately in the Parliament negotiations for the uh, proposal. How do you put all those things together? Is there a problem with that? Um, well, I was going to talk about market abuse first because I think that's, you know, that's a good that's one. The one. <laughs> timing, you know, we're dealing with new things. Yes. Uh, Okay. I mean, we're going to vote. We're going to vote next week on the report that I took through uh, the, the parliamentary committee. Um, I have to say, it was a very tough job, actually, because it was extremely tough. Mm. Because we have a very diversified banking structure. Um, we have uh, particularly big investment banks who hold very firmly to the to the concept that we are undermining universal banking. That they want to continue to be a universal bank. Um, if you scratch behind the surface of that argument, what you'll find is actually what they want to hold on to uh, is implicit subsidies and guarantees for investment market. So we should be quite frank about that. That, that is really where the debate is. And for that reason, having gone for uh, a report and uh, I think proposals that were really trying to tackle some of uh, these issues, um, I then decided um, in order to get a, a parliamentary uh, consensus on it in the committee, um, was that what we ought to go for is a principles-based approach. And therefore, we've gone for those principles in saying, indeed, uh, we should split off in terms of entities, the investment from the retail side. Uh, we should have separate areas of funding. But even that's contested by some colleagues in the committee. They don't believe there should be separate elements of funding. They think that we've argued in the UK for, separate, for a higher capital requirement for retail funding because we have had particular problems in the UK. But actually, what they're not doing is looking to what could happen actually uh, in other European bank systems rather than just saying well we don't need a UK model and I'm not proposing a UK model I think this is actually again you know how do we get a safer model and um, how do we have a more stable model so that you can as, uh, as Sir John said end up saving banks actually and not having everything go under I, and I know that Cyprus is an extreme extreme case of that but nonetheless and it's not it's not something we should use as a model to base on why we need to go for a more fundamental structural reform, but nonetheless, 
Um, what we don't want to do is to end up with a situation where uh, the people that elect me in terms of representatives who have a very simple view of what they want from their banks is they want to be able to, to go to the hole in the wall, they want to get their money out, they want to pay their bills, they want to be able to, if they've sold an apartment, to transfer that money. Uh, and that, I think, as legislators, is our, is our obligation to defend those, those very basic banking fun functions and services on the retail side. And so the whole debate, uh, uh, Commissioner Barney will come forward now with a proposal. I think that what we will give him in our vote next week is a green light, uh, that we do want structural reform. However, the jury's out on how that reform will actually come down to the detail of it. Um, but I do think that the principles are there and what we will need to protect. But there will be a big debate about exactly as Sir John mentioned, where do you put market making? On which side does it sit of, of the fence? Does it sit in with the investment, excessive uh, risky side? Or should it be in there as forms of market making that are necessary uh, for retail customers and for customer type uh, functions? So, so we'll see, but I'm, I'm quite confident that we will get a majority next week for reform, that we do need to have a reform process. Not least because even those who are against reform are now seeing a situation where uh, individual member states are coming forward with their own proposals. So if you have an internal market and financial services, what you can't afford to have is 27 different member states reform process. And there, certainly banks don't want that either. They say to me they don't want to have to operate in 27 jurisdictions according to different rules uh, in this area. So I think the argument is that we will have some form of reform. The question maybe we should ask is why didn't we do that first? Why wasn't the, but, well, that the first issue we tackled Mm -hmm. uh, in 2009 and why we left it to the end of a parliament where actually quite frankly we're, we're running out of time on these issues. I certainly wasn't shaking my head on the importance of equity capital. I was, I was going up and down. I was, I, was, I was nodding it. This may be a cultural issue, but um, uh, that means yes, yes, we do need it. Um, yes. I just wanted to touch on market abuse as an example where, I, where I've been warning of the dangers of uh, making policy in silos without looking at unintended consequences. I think on market abuse, in particular in the, 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 the aspect of that relating to insider trading, we've got a good example here of where people did think across because we had a conflict between those who wanted to tighten up on insider trading and those who were concerned that shareholders um, should be able to come together in putting weight on the boards of companies to behave as they saw it appropriately, i.e. exercising their um, shareholder and ownership rights. And there I think we have worked our way through to a good place where we can encourage stewardship without those uh, institutional shareholders attempting to, to exercise a stewardship role, promptly finding themselves clapped up for insider trading. It's a good example, so I'm not just gloom and doom. So could I just try to clear up one point that I raised? It is an, a slightly ironic thing about the UK recommendations that we made that there are higher capital requirements for retail than for investment banking. The reason is very simple. We were recommending to one country what it should do, yeah. taking the rest of the world as given, and with Basel III as given. If we'd been advising the world, we would not have recommended that. It's just that in, yeah. in investment banking, the, the geographic arbitrage kicks in. You don't need many basis points to create a, a, an artificial incentive. So we were trying to address a very constrained problem in which we thought the global baseline had been pitched too low. And that's the, that's the reason we did it. One other point, I don't see anything in structured universal banking where you can have all the trading, including market making, in a separate entity from um, the, the, the retail side. Any, any inconsistency between that and the needs of the real economy. You can still have one point of, you know, say a small corporate could have one point of con contact with the bank, can get all the derivatives, it might want to do some FX things or whatever. It's just where do those risks ultimately lie? And we think it's much more sensible to have them lying um, separate from the retail part. It's, and I think it's a red herring, this argument that uh, there's something anti that kind of corporate if you go the, uh, the, the kind of structural route that Lickenden talks about. 
Um, well, well, yes. I mean, we, we had quite a lot of problems when we were doing CRD4 in, in how to ensure that we uh, enabled um, you know, the Vickers type ring fencing and other types of ring fencing and how these extra capital buffers did or did not interact with the other buffers and I think in and, the, and of course the Parliament also wanted to make sure that if you had a certain level of uh, systemic relevance you had a certain level of systemic buffer and how was that to interact with whether you had or had not already put on some extra for some ring fence somewhere or another. Uh, the outcome of this is we have a section that really must qualify as the uh, world's worst drafting. Um, and, and I'm sure many, many happy hours will be uh, spent by lawyers uh, looking at it. But, but I mean, I, the, the Parliament said right at the beginning of this mandate, you know, will you please look at crisis resolution first? In fact, we said it at the end of the last mandate, and I'm, I've got sick to death, and you've got sick to death of me hearing, of hearing me saying this. Well, actually, all of this became really, really obvious when we were doing Solvency 2 and trying to work out how to do group support for insurance. And we, you know, just shied away from it there, and we've shied away from it. Now, yes, we've, we've, we've got some of this coming right at the end. And, and really, we, we should start with the resolution plans because then that shows you, nor would have led the way to, uh, thinking about the kind of structured universal banking that, 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 that John has been talking about. I mean, you, you, you won't necessarily have the lines of separation uh, in exactly the same place if you've got a diverse market. Um, so. I think we have to handle this issue with care, but, but the notion that you can apply extra capital where it's needed without being over dictatorial because the different types of structures might mean it's in one place rather than another. Uh, but, but certainly what Cyprus has shown us is that where you have a banking system that you think is well funded with lots of deposits, it raises its own uh, particular problems and that maybe it's no daft idea actually to have more capital on the retail side. Yes, well, that, that's, that's why I you know, asked to talk about it, because in fact, um, fresh, fresh, I think, from the press, we actually did deliver on it, and we have a text, as from yesterday, I think at five o'clock, um, we have an I agree text between Council and Commission and Parliament, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a strong, robust, um, it's a much tougher market abuse regime, uh, it's a regulation, of course, and I mean, I perhaps foolishly said that the test for me would be um, that if following the LIBOR crisis, mm. and of course since then we've also had uh, potential manipulation, uh, uh, an alleged manipulation in other benchmarks, um, most recently in foreign exchange markets, which of course um, we had a bit of a scramble last week. But I was uh, quite convinced when Aunt Sharon asked me had we covered it, I was convinced we'd covered it because we went for a very broad benchmark definition and because as I was drafting the text, that already was a rumour, actually. So that's how far back we're dealing with these issues. Two years ago, there was a rumour that there had been manipulation in the foreign exchange market. So we decided to put that, uh, to make sure that that was covered. But as I said, foolishly, I said that for me, the test, the, the litmus test would be, would we be in a situation again, if LIBOR erupted after we have this regulation, in that we would have those that were are then guilty of, uh, of uh, uh, manipulation and abuse, uh, I think, of some of the worst kind that we've seen in the financial markets, would they uh, be extradited to the US because our rules weren't tough enough? Uh, would they be given higher uh, penalties, higher financial penalties in the US than the EU? And I think that we've closed that gap now because we are trying to get uh, global rules in that area. Um, so I do think that, uh, as I said, we've got a broader scope. We have benchmarks in. Uh, we have commodities in, we've, got, uh, we've, we've uh, brought abusive order entry into scope, uh, we've strengthened protection for whistleblowers. I think that's fundamental, actually, because um, during the, the recent allegations over gas price manipulation, um, we actually had a whistleblower came to my office and asked for help with, with revealing some of this information. But he was very nervous that he would A, lose his job, 
and that actually the consequences for him would not be good by revealing that information. So that's why I think we also felt during the passage uh, of these negotiations that we really had to make sure that we could protect people uh, who want to reveal you know, manipulation or abuse that, that, that is ongoing. Um, we, we didn't get, I think, where we wanted to be on cross-border uh, cross uh, surveillance. I mean, that was an issue that we felt, again, because, um, uh, you know, uh, and Stephen's still here, we talked to ESMA, who brought together for us a lot of the regulators who are dealing with market abuse. They give us examples, you know, in private uh, of cases where, you know, seven or eight member states were cooperating around a particular uh, market abuse case. And therefore, we thought, well, really, we have to be able to share information because this doesn't just happen in one jurisdiction. Um, so we put in, of course, a, a, a quite a, a tough um, obligation, really, um, asking for daily comprehensive order book data from OTFs, MTFs, regulated markets where the share is actively traded. But we knew that that was a tall order. We knew we wouldn't get that. But we did actually want to really impress upon the member states that this job has to begin now. We have to start doing this. If we're serious about it, that we do have to make sure that competent authorities have access to information and that they can cooperate in this area. So we do have a, a, a link in there. And of course, we've been told that it will have to be dealt with in MIFID because it's a structural markets issue. Um, but for that reason, because we suspected that's what the member states would say to us, we, we put the same amendment into MIFID. So the amendment will be in MIFID. It will be up to Sharon now to, to negotiate that with the MIFID team. So I, again, I think we've been quite tough in covering the, these issues. Um, what can I say that's negative? And maybe I should say something that is a little bit negative. Um, I think that one of, the, one of the problems we're continuing to come up against when in trial log, and I find them increasingly difficult, and I've been around a long time, uh, is that member states are not willing to give powers very easily, or whether give away powers in terms of what their own competent authorities do. Um, in the case of, of market abuse, of course, because we went much tougher uh, in the regulation, it does mean that for some member states who've got different legal traditions, who've got constitutional issues, uh, here in Germany, where we are at the moment, uh, it does mean that they say they reserve the right not to apply these administrative sanctions because they are so draconian that it tips them into actually, therefore, a criminal procedure. Now, we spent a long time having a long negotiation about this because we said that what we didn't want to do was actually to provide for an opt-out clause that you then opted out of the regulation. Um, and what we then achieved, I think, was a lot of, a lot of wrangling on this issue, and we had some support from the Commission um, who are here today as well, is that we will then force member states if they decide to exercise the criminal option, because of course their argument is that that, in a sense, is a tougher route. Well, it is tougher, but as we all know, it's a higher hurdle in terms of proving uh, market abuse in a criminal court, and it's more difficult to gather the evidence. So quite often we know that many of those cases fail, actually, whereas administrative sanctions don't generally fail. Um, so from that perspective, we said you have to inform the Commission uh, when you're triggering, when you go in, you trigger into a criminal procedure, uh, and we therefore um, want that to be put down very clearly. And then um, Stephen will probably not be very pleased that we've given ESMA a role, because we keep giving ESMA lots of tasks in this area, that those, uh, those, uh, those uh, member states that, that choose the criminal option then um, will then have to aggregate in, on, in anonymous form, because we also had a big row about data protection, etc., but there will be anonymous and aggregated data regarding all the criminal investigations that they undertake and the penalties, the criminal penalties that are imposed by their judicial authorities. That will then be sent for EDSMA to publish a report, and then we will see if it's not working. But that will mean that we'll have to revisit it in three years' time, and then we can hit hard with a hammer and say, actually, you took an option, but the option you took actually was to be less tough on market abuse. Uh, and that will allow us, as I said, to come back within three years' time to look at that. So, uh, on balance, I think it is a tougher regime. Uh, I think that um, we will be able to, to say we have global equivalence in this area. It's not the same rules, but we have global equivalence. Uh, and I think, you know, we also have permanent bans, which the U.S. has and some member states have. We have a permanent ban on trading. Again, that was a very difficult issue for us to negotiate. Um, you know, we, when we said the U.S. has permanent bans, some member states have it, they said yes, but the U.S. has a death penalty. Are we suggesting introducing that? Uh, my answer to that was, well, let me ask you a question. In any of your criminal systems, or your, would you have 
a paedophile be allowed to go and work back in a nursery or a school. And so that's the other side of that argument. And so I think what we, we really have, I think, got quite a good deal, and we will vote this through in September, and, uh, and let's see how it works. The, the proof always is we have to go back and see how it's implemented. Sure, thank you, John. Um, first of all, um, I agree with very much uh, with much of what was said here. Um, Sir John Vickers is, um, is probably right that you need structural change for resolution to work. Uh, I wouldn't say, John, that that's uh, too present at the global level, that argument. Maybe you should be making it. Um, uh, and I do agree with you that I think um, and the cross-border dimension here is, is, absolutely, is absolutely critical. Uh, and I'm saying I, I'm outside uh, globally, internationally. Uh, so I think uh, there is a huge uh, job of work to be, to be done there. Although I think there's been a lot of progress on the intellectual side in the sense of agreeing bail-inable uh, proposals. I mean, the Basel Agreement you were mentioning uh, has moved from 50 to 33 times leverage. It's also moved from 70 pages to 700. Um, and uh, I, I have a sense as a, as a regulator or former regulator that complexity is one of our worst enemies, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, we need to pay far more attention to keeping the system as simple as possible, and especially understanding it, uh, because I'm not sure we understand all elements of it. Uh, Baroness Hogg, I, I couldn't agree more with you when you said that uh, the crucial role of equity markets uh, I always felt that there was some sort of tax discrimination in a way uh, in, in this space. And I think there's an, an enormous opportunity emerging for equity markets, particularly for the financing of small and medium-sized companies. And if we can't do that in Europe, um, uh, I think we're in big, big trouble. Uh, so I, I can only uh, appeal to Judith and all her colleagues to uh, continue working here. And I think it's a huge and important uh, opportunity uh, for uh, equity markets uh, in the future. Uh, Sharon, you're right, and I've always agreed with you about uh, what you said about transaction mapping. I think you made the point extremely clearly. Um, Arlene, uh, I couldn't uh, either agree with you more that I think uh, my own view is that sanctions in capital market, in financial markets in general, have been woefully weak. Uh, they haven't deterred. Uh, you can read all the evidence in the LIBOR scandals to just take one example of that. So I personally am in favor of much, much tougher sanctions uh, uh, throughout um, uh, and in order to provide uh, some real uh, uh, incentive for proper behavior. Uh, and uh, I think that is why in IOSCO we're working on the elements of deterrent uh, uh, sanctions, uh, sanctions uh, regimes. So uh, a few thoughts, uh, 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 John. Uh, I think uh, uh, more convergence in many ways than divergence. Thank you.